Boy, y'all were singing good. I didn't say that. You can blame your lustrous leader for that. I did not say that. <laughs> I think you're going to have to dig your way out of that hole, Brother Mark, by yourself. So I'm sorry. I fell really deep, too. Yeah, you did. You did. I want to speak for the next few minutes on uh, a passage out of the Old Testament if you want to be going over there, Genesis chapter 26. And uh, it's the story of when Isaac had to uh, contend over water rights, basically. You know, today in, in Florida, I don't know if you know this, but all of our water is controlled by certain boards. You know that? How many of you know that? You've got uh, Swanee River Management, I think, and then you have Swift Mud, and you have all these people that tightly controlled what happens to the water in Florida. And, and I'm glad they do to a degree because we don't want our water to, to uh, be you know, polluted and used in the wrong way. But sometimes it can be kind of sticky when you want to do something on your own property and they come and tell you, no, you can't do that. Well, in, in the old days when you would travel uh, across the deserts like Abraham did and you would acquire land, you would actually have to dig your own wells. There weren't too many wells there or springs. So in the desert area, you'd just have to dig one. Now, how many of you have ever actually dug a well yourself? Let me see your hand if you've ever dug a well. One, two, three, four, five, six. Did you have a machine that you did yours, Gary? By hand. Did you have a machine? Like a drill type machine? And, and how far did you have to go to get your water? 70 feet. How far did you go, Gary? 20. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like he's talking about. It would pull up, and pull the the pipe with a heavy thing, and it would doom, doom, drive it down. Right. In Florida, you don't have to go as far as you have to go in the desert. Where I live, you can dig down about five feet and hit water. In the Gulf Hammock area. Now you don't want to drink that water too much, but you have to go a little deeper to get good water. But in that arid climate or that hot desert climate there in uh, Abraham's day in Israel, you had. Uh, I mean, it was tough getting water. And so Abraham and his servants would dig wells wherever they were because they had a, a vast herd of flocks. And uh, over the uh, years, as he raised his family and raised his flocks, they would use the same well over and over again because these wells were put down deep into that, that sometimes solid rock. And they would cut down by hand, cut down no machines, and uh, make these wells. and. And it, uh, of course, water being vital to our existence and vital to your flocks. So when he went off the scene and left his land and his animals to Isaac, remember there's three people, Abraham, Isaac, and remember the, we call them the what? The patriarchs, don't we? The, father, the fathers of, of the faithful of the past and the fathers of the Jewish uh, family. Well, they would, uh, you know, pass their land down to one another. And, and uh, when Isaac came along, uh, some of the water rock things were, were really getting in high gear because the, the uh, Philistines of that area all claimed it was their wells. They were fighting Isaac continually for the, the same wells that his daddy had dug. His family had had all those years. They would claim them or they would stop them up. And they would put uh, like rotten animal, animals in there, dead animals and rocks and just pollute the well. And uh, so it was a real problem up into the time of, of Isaac. But in Isaac's day, and the thought today is Isaac chose to dig new wells. Chose to dig new wells. I want you to think about that today as you think about our Christian school, why we do what we do. I want you to tie it all together here in just a little bit. Why do we do what we do? Why in the world we've got all these great schools and all this money that the government's poured into these public government schools, why in the world would we need a Christian school, a church school of all things? We don't have near the money available to us to, to build our systems. We don't have the buses. We don't have the facilities. We don't get any of the things, the perks that the other system gets. Yet we choose to do it anyway. And you'll understand in a little while why we do it. But Isaac, rather than fight and continue to fight over those old wells his father had dug, he chose to dig new wells. So let's go to the scripture this morning, and, and we're going to be looking at uh, Genesis 26, and I'm going to I'm going to read a couple of passages to you from Genesis 26, 
and I'm going to start a little uh, earlier than what I'm showing there. I'm going to start around verse 12. Genesis 26, beginning with verse 12. So when Isaac planted his crops that year, he harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted, for the Lord blessed him. He became a very rich man, and his wealth continued to grow. He acquired so many flocks of sheep and goats and herds of cattle and servants that the Philistines became jealous of him, so the Philistines filled up all of Isaac's well with dirt. These were the wells that had been dug by the servants of his father Abraham. Finally, Abimelech ordered Isaac to leave the country. Go somewhere else, he said, for you have become too powerful, powerful for us. So Isaac moved away to Gerar Valley where he set up their tents and settled down. He reopened the wells his father had dug, which the Philistines had filled in after Abraham's death. Isaac also restored the names that Abraham had given them. Isaac's servants also dug in Gerar Valley and discovered a well of fresh water. But then the shepherds from Gerar came and claimed the spring. This is our water, they said, and they argued over it with Isaac's herdmen. So Isaac named the well Esek, which means argument. Isaac's men then dug another well, but again there was a dispute over it, so Isaac named it Sitna, which means hostility. Abandoning that one, Isaac moved on and dug another well. This time there was no dispute over it, so Isaac named the place Rehoboth, which means open space. For he said, at last the Lord has created enough space for us to prosper in this land. From there Isaac moved to Beersheba, where the Lord appeared to him on the night of his arrival. I am the God of your father Abraham, he said. Do not be afraid, for I am with you and will bless you. I will multiply your descendants and they will become a great nation. I will do this because of my promise to Abraham, my servant. Then Isaac built an altar there and worshipped the Lord. And he set up his camp at that place. And his servants dug another well. Well digging. Digging another well. Let's begin with prayer today as we think about this thought and how it ties into what we are doing and what we're going to do today with our teachers. Lord, I thank you so much for the scripture. And I thank you, Lord, that we have precedent set before us, Lord, by the patriarchs of old that sometimes there's just time to, to move on and not stay with the old, uh, abandon the old things that are all polluted and messed up, Lord. We have to do our own thing. We have to dig our own wells. Thank you, Lord, for giving uh, our pastor before us, Lord, wisdom on how to do that. And Lord, help us to continue to do it as long as we live. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And all God's children said, Amen. See, the enemies of Abraham kept claiming the water rights of the wells. Now, who dug the wells? Abraham did, didn't he? What did God say to Abraham when he entered that land? He said, as far as your feet will tread, I will do what? I'll give you all this land. So in reality, whose land was it? Abraham's land. See, a lot of times today, the Palestinians claim that land. They say it's our land, and the Israelis are, are encroaching on our land. No, <laughs> the Palestinians are encroaching on the Israelis' land, and they don't have all that they're going to have yet. In reality, Israel's not near as big as it's going to be when God fully restores their land to them. He hasn't fully restored all of their land yet, because it's a lot bigger if you go into the Scripture and, and look at what God said they were going to have. And that will occur in, in the future. But right now, uh, back in this time, Abraham, you know, what the, the problem was when he died, the enemies came in and started filling up the wells and claiming the water rights that uh, they had dug and made possible to be in that land. See, Isaac had to continually search for water due to these confrontations. How many of you like confrontations? I don't like confrontation. Now, I will, if I have to, I will confront you, you know, but I don't like to. And, you know, a lot of times we, we tend to, rather than fight, we move to another spot, you know, and say, okay, you take that and go on. That's basically what he was doing. Okay, fine, that's yours. We'll, we'll just move on. And he had plenty of servants, so they would dig another well wherever they went, and then the enemy would come and say, that's our water. No, it wasn't their water. The water wasn't even there until they dug the hole. So, but they would move on, do another one, move on, do another one. And they were, he was trying his best not to be at war with the people of that land. And he would move on and he would dig another well. See, Isaac made the correct choice to dig new wells. You say, why didn't he just peacefully coexist with the, the people of the land and pay them to use his water? <laughs> because that's really what it would have happened. 
Isaac would have had to pay the people of the land in order to use the water that was already his. And he chose not to do that. He said, no, we'll just we'll dig our own wells. And he moved over and dug another well. Now, I want you to see the parallel between what we do in Christian schooling today and the reason that Christians like us have Christian schools. It's the same principle. Listen, in, in, in the past, the colleges and schools of America were started in the churches by Christians long ago. It's without dispute. Now, you might want to start collecting your data sources and your historical sources and keeping them for yourself because I don't know if you know this, but most of your, your sites that, that you do research on these days is tightly controlled by Silicon Valley and the liberals there. How many of you know that? Listen, I've noticed lately on Google things that have art histories that's already changing. I tried to search for something this week that's been out there forever. I barely could find it because they're just pushing it back and hiding it and putting their, their view forward on a lot of, a lot of issues. Uh, and I said, ooh, it's a good thing maybe we need to hold on to our books because if we lose our history, and if history is being rewritten, which it, it is being rewritten, by the way, the purpose of the Common Core curriculum is to rewrite American history. And it's already you know, in place in a lot of places in our schools today, but... Historically, churches have played a vital role in the American educational process. In the past 60 years or so, there, has, there was a reawakening of, of Christian schooling, really. Uh, some of it was started because of segregation, and they, that was not a good motivation to start Christian schools or private schools. That's what some Christian, or private schools started because of the integration thing. I don't think that was a good motivation at all. But the other ones that started schools to escape the, the uh, encroaching his liberalism and secular humanism, that was a good, mu good motivation, and I'm glad that they did. See, in, the, in days of old, in the original American school, and you'll understand in a little bit why I say the original American school, which was in the churches, many times the pastor served as the teacher as well as the, pa the preacher. Educational excellence and personal character development were the primary focus in those early American schools. I've, I've, I've got a copy of, of McGuffey's Readers. You, ever, you know who that? This, these were the textbooks of the early school. The McGuffey Readers, okay, before the... I don't have this up there. Oh, you weren't telling me to put it up there. <laughs> I was wondering if you going to... I was, I was taking signals from my wife. Listen... We have, oh, you're telling me, yeah, we do have the whole set of these. Listen, to, this is a public school textbook, McGuffey Reader. Listen, listen to this part. I just picked up a, this is the eclectic first reader for young children with pictures. The man for whom John worked was very kind to John and gave him a great deal of advice. One day he said to him, John, you must always bear in mind that it was God who made you and who gave you all that you have and all that you hope for. He gave you life and food and home. All who take care of you and help you were sent you by God. Or help, to help you were sent to you by God. He sent His Son to show you, show you His will and to die for your sake. He gave His Word to let you know that He had done for you and what He wants you to do. Be sure that He sees you in, in the dark as well as in the day and in the light. He can tell you all that you do and all that you say and all that is in your mind. Oh, ever seek God. Pray to Him when you rise and when you lie down. Keep His day here, you know, hear His word and do His will and He will love you and will be your God forever. Ooh, public school textbook. You read that in school today and what would happen? Your teacher, you'd be fired, number one. But they would, they would throw that out so quick. Oh, get religion out of the public school. And then they let... <laughs> transvestites come and read to children. We've come a long way, baby. <laughs> in a long way in the, in the wrong direction. But see, even after a, a century after the advent of the, the, the government public schools, the Christian influence was still there. I know a lot of good Christians that still teach in public school. When I was in public school, in the 50s, when I was in first grade, second grade, third grade, every day my teacher read out of the Bible to me public school. I learned Psalms 100. I learned Psalms 23. I learned the golden rule from public school. You say, public school? Oh yeah, public school. You see, listen folks, it's changed and something happened to the system 
you know, something started polluting the system and it took the morality and the decency and the godliness out of, out of the public system, the system that the Christians started long ago. Did you know Harvard, Princeton, Yale, all the Ivy League colleges were, were Christian colleges? <laughs> Did you know the University of Florida was a seminary at one time? You've heard of Murphy Hall? How many of you have heard of Murphy Hall? Murphy was the, the superintendent of this whole University of Florida. He required that every teacher there in the University of Florida go to chapel every week and be a member of a, a local church of some sort. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? The faculty of UF, and they had to go to chapel every week. It's changed, hasn't it? it? Sure has changed. And something happened to the well. The well that at one time was pure, good education has, has been polluted. Now, it's hard to pollute math. <laughs> you know, the formulas, that guy's hard to pollute that. But listen, all the other stuff that is added to that, you know, the, 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 the stuff that is the uh, subjective and how people feel about life, all that changed and they, they took God out of the system. See, in 1963, with no precedent in the American court history, the Supreme Court radically altered the direction of American education and they took God out of the, out of the educational system. No precedent whatsoever. And Madeleine Murray O'Hare and, and some liberals, a, little, a few people changed the course direction of American education. Nine liberal black robe, unelected <laughs> Supreme Court justices rob Mer uh, America of her heritage. That's why it's so critical that we put conservative people in the Supreme Court. Unlike uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, highly left-wing liberal woman that was appointed in her, and the others almost as liberal as her, you know, the ones that were appointed in the last couple of uh, echelons of the, of the presidency. And they're, they're making a big deal about Kavanaugh and, and our president now trying to appoint conservative justices. I hope he gets to appoint four more before he's out of there. And I hope each one of them is a constitutionalist and, and thinks in the, in the right direction about our constitution. But back to the, the subject of education. Education changed even though it was started in the, in the churches. See, according to the Bible, God commands parents to train children, not government. The government has zero business being in education. They don't need to be in education. That's a local issue. See, but what we're so used to it. The government, let, let the government do it. Can you imagine this for a moment? If you were Moses out there and the children of Israel in the desert, would you think that he would let his kids get on a yellow bus and go back to Egypt for their schooling during the daytime? Same principle. You know, we turn our children over to people that don't even believe anything that we believe. They mock this book. They ridicule what, what it says. <laughs> they teach things can, entirely different than that. And you see, American education changed. See, the, the Christian school movement is not new in America. It's been here all along. It's just been pushed to the back. I can take you right now to Gulf Hammond, Florida and show you a one-room schoolhouse that still stands. It used to be a church on Sunday and a schoolhouse during the week. And it was only two different sections, two different grades in there. You know, there were, it was a multi-graded type of school. My daddy, when I was a little bitty boy, would go and preach early, preach early service there. And I'd follow him along. And, and then we'd go back to Otter Creek and he'd preach there. But, but they, it was a school too. I have pictures of, of some of the classes that were there. You see, uh, the Christian school movement's not new in America. And in reality... The Christian school movement is the traditional school of America. Public education is not the traditional school of America. You know, we bought that, that uh, belief because it's been around for so long and it, and it has controlled so much. But see, the teachers in the schools uh, of America used to teach morality and clean living. Here's one, here's one of the uh, little excerpt out of the textbooks. You probably can't see it. But uh, A, in Adam's fall we send all. B, Thy life's to men, this book attend. And it has the Holy Bible right there. Uh, we'll jump on down. Uh, let me jump over here. Time cat cuts down all, both great and small. Uh, whalers in the sea, whales in the sea, God's voice obey. See, the, everything, even the alphabet was tied to the Word of God. Listen, our, our founding fathers had it right. And when they established the school system, 
it was a Christian school system teaching the precepts and concepts of the Bible and how people ought to live. You see, education really is life. Teaching young people how to live. I remember talking to my first and second grade teacher. She died at the age of 100. And uh, I, I interviewed her before she died. And I, her name was Miss Marie Meeks. And she taught in Levy County for about 40 years down there. She was the, there was two women that were the first two women in Levy County to get their master's degrees in education from UF. She was one of them. And another lady in our church who was a librarian also was the other one. But I asked Miss Marie, I said, Miss Marie, did they have rules for how teachers lived back then? When you were teaching, how did, you know, did they require you to, to live a certain way or act a certain way? Oh, yeah. We couldn't be out after 10 o'clock at night with a person of the opposite sex. We had to have, wear dresses down to our knees. <laughs> we had to be in church on Sunday. I mean, she had a whole list of things that were required of the teachers because in that day, teaching was called the Ministry of Education. In fact, a lot of the political, there were political realm, you know, the Ministry of Politics, the Ministry of this, the Ministry why? Because people that led the country and led our children were supposed to be people of moral character, high moral character. Boy, look what's happening today with teachers. Look how many teachers are going to court for doing all sorts of stuff they shouldn't be doing to students or with students. That's not how it was in America. America it was a... A, a godly system that taught people how to live. That's why we, we really interview our teachers well and we want teachers that have a high moral caliber in their life. And if they, we see something not happening or something happening in their life that shouldn't be there, let's have a conference here, lady and gentlemen. <laughs> Come to my office. We, we talk about it and say, we, you know, no, no. This, here's what our code of conduct says for the teacher. Here's how you should act. And here's how you shouldn't act. And you, you agreed to do this. You agreed not, agreed not to do that. You know, we want people of high moral fiber teaching your children. How many think that's a good idea? If we expect the children to live right, shouldn't we expect the teachers to live right? Amen? I think we all agree on that. But what happened in American education, these two uh, champions of the left and champions of the public system John Dewey and Horace Mann, many people hold them up as, as heroes of, the, of America. They're not heroes. They imported a Prussian view of, of government controlled and sponsored education. That's where it came from. And slowly but surely, that system took over and pushed godliness and, and decency in the Bible completely out of it. You know, trying to educate people how to live without the precepts and morality of the Bible. And, uh, you know, I don't think the result has been very good as far as where it's taken American education. Compare our scores now, since it's fully secular, to what it used to be before all that took place. You know, we used to lead the world in education. Now we're down, falling down toward the bottom in education. And it all goes back to the government trying to run and control education and, and run it without biblical morality but the good news is this that's a lot of bad news of what happened there the good news is this pastors across America woke up pastors across America realized they had to reestablish Christian schools to overcome this and Isaac went and dug some new wells he said okay Philistines you have that well you polluted it you messed it up you stopped it up we're going to dig a new well and pastors all over America began to do this and our dad Pastor Gene Keith was one of those guys. He's still alive, sitting right over there. And I'm proud of him because he was one of the visionary pastors in this area. And they were all over America. God raised up a lot of them in the early, late 60s and early 70s. God raised up an army of pastors like him that had a new vision for education in America and didn't know anything about a Christian school and how to start one. And God motivated a lot of them to do that. He realized that the wells of learning called public schools had been polluted. Folks, I lived through it. I lived through the change because I was in the system when God was there and I was in the system when it changed and when God wasn't there. And I can promise you that they can write anything they want to on Snopes and say it wasn't true. I scoped it this week and, and, and on Google, I Google it. You remember the... You remember seeing the little thing about what the, the problems of school in the 50s, chewing gum and da, 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 that sort of thing? Try to find that on Google now. 
See, it's already they've already pulled that off, and, and Snoke says that was never true, and that's not that was just a myth, and da da da. It's always been bad in school. No, it hasn't. <laughs> no, it hadn't. You know, there wasn't much. There wasn't. People weren't killing people on campus when I was a kid. You didn't have to have policemen on the campus to to keep children safe when I was a kid. You know, that's there's that's a that's a crock. And don't believe everything Snoke says because you know who Snoke is. How many of you know who you've heard of that, right? It's it's just a liberal couple out in California. And how are they going to view everything that you that anybody writes is through their lens? You know, and if you only have a one-way lens, then of course that's what they're going to always see. Listen, the school system used to be a lot better, and there wasn't much problem. You know, there was a fight once in a while, you know, and they but you'd normally go to the office and get a paddling for it, you know, and then you go back to class, you know. We we got in trouble for shooting marbles and playing keepsies. How many of you know what that means? We had marble games, and you, if you if you hit the other guy's marble, like you got to keep it. That was called keep season, and the teachers wouldn't let us do it because that was gambling. Really, that's a gamble. You can't do that. You see, there was a sense of morality, and, and it was there was not that big. That wasn't a big deal. Once in a while, you'd have something, you know, relatively bad happen, but nothing like today. You never had people getting murdered on campus. You know, see the, the daddy and others like him realized the wells of learning had been polluted and. Uh, just like Isaac o, of old, he said, let's dig a new well. And there's the old building. We, that's where we came from, by the way. That's the old south side. It no longer stands. It's gone now. And it's in Porter's Quarters, and some community center is now sitting there in, in place of what used to be a, a thriving Baptist church. But he and his helpers began to the task of starting a Christian school. There are only two of us still alive out of that picture. Where's Stuart? Is Stuart here today? Y'all see Stuart Campbell back there? I don't see him. He might not be here today, but he's getting on up in age and walks with a walker. And and I don't. Have, you notice I had dark hair and a mustache. I don't have that anymore. You know, I do have a mustache once in a while, but when I do, it's it's white <laughs> like my hair. You know, that was a long time ago. That was about 1973-ish, somewhere around in there. But that was the Deacon Trustee Board, and we we followed our pastor. And our pastor said, let's start a school. Yes, sir, we'll do it. Let's do it. So we began planning and praying. And here is uh, our treasure. My dad, we're looking at a original plan was to go on Tower Road. Right there where Kinder Care is on Tower Road. We bought seven and a half acres. And we're going to build a facility right there. And we, the more we prayed about it, the Lord said, that's not big enough. You know, you're not going to have near enough room to have what, you're, what we're going to do. So we started looking and God led us to this 40 acres out here. And we sold the seven and a half acres and a few years later paid off the, the 40 acres and uh, moved our uh, countryside uh, or south side out here. But here's the original student body of South Side Christian School. Any of our student or any of our adults here that were in that picture, where you're at? If, y'all, if you were here, stand up for a minute. Look around for a minute. There's one. Nobody else in that picture? Jimmy was. David's here. Is he out? Out security today. Okay, he's well, there's two here from that original picture, but that was our original student body in that little tiny cramped building there on Southwest Second Terrace in in Porter's Quarters, Florida. You know, and God used this little tiny Southern Baptist Church, Southern Southside Baptist Church there, to start a new dig a new well in Gainesville, Florida. You say, what? Much old crackers? I don't know what you're doing. Well, God led our pastor to dig a new well, and I'm sure thankful he did. I'm sure thankful he did. God started this great school and quite a few others from that humble beginning at Southside Baptist Church in Southwest Gainesville. We give him praise and honor for the great things that he's done and is doing. We inherited Riverside Christian School. It used to be Swanee River Valley Christian. We inherited it 12 years ago. And it's going strong. Miss Gwen, if you'll stand up, here's our principal at, at Riverside. Give her a hand. Uh, 130 to 150 students all the time at Riverside now. And they, they on football, they kick our rear ends when they come over here. Old country boys get out and come over here in two cars and whip us and go home, you know. Corn fed, you know. But corn fed. Uh, 
We also co are connected to the Creekside Christian in a school in Otter Creek that I started when I was pastor in there. They have around 100 students. We're connected by uh, just by association and, and helping start the school, Vision Christian in, in Raleigh. They have about f almost 60 students there now. Uh, we help start Passage Christian on the other side of Gainesville. They're 50, 60, 70s all the time now. My father was instrumental in starting uh, more than that, 15 or 20 in the state of Florida during that period of time. And uh, we're helping start new schools and dig new wells every chance we can. Every chance we can. Part of my, my job as the pastor is not only to pastor you, but I help other people dig new wells. And I was inspired by Pastor Meritus, our father, to do that. And uh, you, you say, you spend a lot of time away from doing stuff. Well, we believe it's important. We believe the future of America is at stake. We believe the future of these children are at stake. And we're going to spend as much time as necessary to help every local church that we can within our reach to do the same thing and dig their own well. Today we gather to dedicate this year's crop of, of our teachers and staff members and Riverside if their teachers are here and Countryside some of their all of their teachers I think are here uh, we enter our 44th year of operation at Countryside Christian School isn't that crazy to start in the little old corner of Southwest Gainesville and 300 and you say 308 Jody or Jody 308 students and growing it's crazy isn't it Gwen, Miss Gwen's growing. Uh, Creekside's growing. Uh, Vision's growing. Passage is growing. Another uh, church over in the other side of the lake, uh, the lake over there on Newman's Lake, I won't tell you yet about it, but it's within about 24 miles of here. It's going to start one in the fall. And they're, they're chomping at the bit, and they've asked us to come help them. I cannot tell you in recent years how many of our African-American pastors have approached me he said, we need help. What can we do? Show us how to do it. <laughs> and I said, thank you, God. Catching, vision, or catching the burden. They're the new Isaacs of this generation. And, and folks, we're going to dig some new wells. <laughs> I can promise you. You say, we're trying to, you're trying to hurt the public school system. No, I'm not. We gave it to them. It's their, it's their wells now. Okay, I don't, Let them keep on going. And we're going to help funnel good. That's what's kind of crazy. <laughs> some of our graduates end up teaching there. Yeah, you think that's good? Yeah, I think yes, because you got godly, character young women and young men, and they go back into that system, and they'll make a difference there. But in the meantime, I've got little ones that I've got to be careful not to pollute or allow to be polluted. So, in fact, Monique, right there, Monique's going to be. You're teaching at Vision this year, aren't you? Monique's teaching at Vision. It's awesome. And one of our girls that we won to Christ, discipled, used her in, in uh, different positions. She went through Liberty University while working at Otter Creek. Now she's the principal where Monique is at, at Vision. Isn't that cool? See, God is doing a great work in our area. And today we're going to dedicate these young people, these uh, young teachers to Christ and to uh, this task. So Jody, if you'll get your staff and Miss Gwen and whoever's with you and any other teachers that want to come up, let's just have a dedication time. I'll let you introduce them too, Jody, if you would. Microphone right over there. Yeah, he's got one right there, Mr. Mark. Miss Gwen, give her one in case she has some of her teachers. I, I mentioned a homeschool. If you're a homeschool teacher, if you're a homeschooler, come on up. We'd love to dedicate your you too. Granddaddy, we're going to let you do the dedication prayer if you'll come on up here in a few minutes. This is the one that started it all for us, so we're going to let him do our dedication prayer today. What's in I teach reading and I'm here at Countryside. My name is Lisa. I'm here at Countryside. 
heart. My name is Jessica Melbourne. I'm the ninth and tenth grade monitor at Countryside. I'm Karen Gilbert at her Countryside. I'm the fifth grade monitor this year. Marlene Malone and Countryside High School Spanish. I'm Janice Riley and I'm in from Countryside. I'm working in love control with him. I'm Linda Dagger. I'm a seventh grade monitor and also a graduate. Countryside in 1984. <laughs> Rainy Morensi, I'm here at Countryside and fifth grade supervisor. Christine, here at Countryside, I'm first grade. Christine Robertson, sixth grade teacher at Countryside. Natalie Wilson, I'm here at Countryside, I'll be in the front office this year. Mark Thomas. Seventh grade supervisor here at Countryside. Charity Thomas, second grade teacher, Countryside. Faith Meyer, school secretary, Countryside. Shelly Bates, I'm the eighth grade monitor, and I'm here Countryside. Jesse Robertson, I'm the office manager for Countryside um, and the church in Riverside School. Darren Monty, um, Jody's assistant and the assistant. Kathy Smith, first grade, the countryside. Mike Cunningham, coach C, PE, tutoring, countryside. I am now in three and four year olds here at countryside. Ruth Roberts, sixth grade monitor here at countryside. Marsha Fairbrook, resource teacher and active here. Carol Lorenz, countryside after here. Robbins, Riverside, and I'll have second every day. Ginger Russell, Riverside, and I'm office manager. Gwen Keith, principal, Riverside Christian School. David Keith, countryside, and I'm in grade. Norma Milton, countryside, third grade. Rebecca Boyd, countryside, third grade. Boyd, maintenance technician, countryside. Valerie Anders, state grade supervisor here at countryside. Karen McLeod, countryside, fourth grade teacher. Astrid Crespo, um, fourth grade teacher here in countryside. Jennifer Parrish, here at countryside. Chambliss, second and third grade, Vision Christian Academy. I'm Steve Carlson, I help uh, with the ninth and tenth grade at Countryside, but also I teach teachers and lead teams to teach the Bible in public elementary schools here across the North Central Florida. Okay. I want to recognize uh, Jerry Milton, Brother Jerry, if you'll stand up. Yes, yes sir, Brother Jerry. Will for 14 years, give him a hand. Uh, Pastor was the first principal, then he had uh, Mr. Keith Spurgers after him for a while, then uh, Brother Jerry was next, and then they threw the ball to me. I was principal for 13 years, and then the ball was thrown to Mr. David, for three minutes today. Your principal, how long? 16 years, and yeah, now Jody has inherited it. Now, so I'm going to ask Pastor Maricus if he'll leave this dedicated for you. Good morning, everybody. 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 Condition is different. Don't start a condition of school. Go two through twelve the first year. In July, we're going to do the parents. July, school starts in September, two through twelve. And the teacher, I mean the parents, would say, well, 
your interview. Are your teachers certified by the city? You don't have the first teacher here. They say, well, I said, well, God does the Father. They pause a moment, and every parent, not one, backed out. And we didn't have the first teacher yet. In July, that I had back surgery in July. Had to recuperate for a week. And God was teaching us the lesson. I want you to understand this lesson. I'm a solid time. God gives the people that can't do it. So when it's done, he gets the credit for it. Well, I was lying in bed recuperating from back surgery in 1974. God brought all the teachers and monitors to my bedroom at Orange Lake. And we hired them there and started to teach them. We planned for 40 students. We had 80. And what you see here in the mirror, I grant you do real well. Um, as Bill said a while ago, a lot of private schools were started because of segregation. Ours was never a school like that. We were in Porter's Quarter in Gainesville. Just an example of two. Our first African American graduate, Paul Young, checked on Google, has her own law firm in Orlando. Robbie Pruitt played football here, a little, little redneck from Hawthorne. He's been a public school coach ever since he graduated. He played with Jimmy and David and Steve here playing football. This is one of the He's won more Florida high school championships than any coach in Florida high school history. Lisa Taylor, London, a little short, beautiful little kid, gave her heart to Christ on the front of the road out of horseshoe to Scotland one day. Played ball here. Went through the University of Florida and law school in five years. I said university and law school in five years. She's a circuit court judge in Orlando. Now, not all of our graduates have done that, but I'm going to tell you one more thing that we're going to pray. Take the best churches in the Baptist denomination and let all of the young people stand up. When they graduate from high school, if they go to public schools, 80 plus percent will leave church and never come back to church again. Over 8 out of 10, a 20% success rate. So God allowed our church to dig some new wells 44 years ago this year. Didn't have the first teacher in, in July, school starting in September. And look, it's good. Now these are ministers. They're in, this is my opinion, I could be wrong. I believe these people are involved in the most important work going on in the United States of America today. You tell me something else is more important. On Monday morning when the other kids were bus back in Egypt for education, several hundred boys and girls are getting a quality education and the work of God with godly teachers and coaches teaching them, pouring their lives into them. These teachers are meant to sacrifice the work in the Christmas school. When I was trying to interview teachers back in July 74, I thought they'd be, I knew a number of teachers that were teaching the public school that were teenagers in the churches in those days when I was a pastor. They graduated. Not one would leave the public school teaching the Christian school because of this. In my last review, we'll be there at nine. I got a call at five or nine. I'm not coming. I said, she's got changed my mind. I said, listen carefully. This is my last remark. How many times I said that? <laughs> this is important. I said, why have you changed your mind? She said, my pastor said I should not leave the public school. 
teach in public in Christian school. And God provided, and God has provided all of these right here today. So I'll ask you something. Well, I pray to preach. Will you raise your right hand to God and pray with me? You pray quietly while I pray out loud. Dear God, thank you so much for what you've done. Again, you did it. We're not playing humble. You did it, and you allowed us to have a part in it. So I pray for anointing of the Holy Ghost upon all of these teachers and monitors and coaches and helpers that are here before us today. That you'll anoint them with a special anointing for these latter part of the latter days. Give them strength. Give them energy. Give them, I know they'll be tired. They'll be discouraged at times. And help them, Father, to realize we work for the parents. The parents don't work for us. We work for them. And we're pouring our lives into the kids. Please give us the best year we've ever had. Please. Please. Anoint us and anoint them with power today. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Pastor Bill, we... We did not do a very good job of giving the people an opportunity to give this morning. That's true. I forgot to do that. We'll tell them. Yes. The, the offering yeah. box is right there in front of the sound booth. It's a metal box. So if you forgot to do that, we forgot to tell you to do that. Let's drop it in there. It's in the foyer. Good. Okay. It's in the foyer right up there on the table. Okay. Thank you, teachers. And uh, give them a hand. Okay, if you're a student, whether you go to school here, public school, home school, we don't care where you go, we want to dedicate you this year for you. So you come up here and let us pray for you because every student needs prayer. So let's dedicate you to the Lord this year. If you are in the government system, you, God might have you there as to be a witness, so we need to pray that you'll be a good witness to those in that system. Where's Steve, Brother Steve Carlson? Come help me, Brother Steve. Brother Steve Carlson is our Child Evangelism Fellowship Director for Northeast Florida. And he has a super, super heart for children. And uh, I'll let him do the, the dedicatory prayer for the children here in just a minute. All right. Okay, isn't this neat? This is our future, isn't it? Yeah. And, uh, we just want to say, for all of us, Students, that we love you a lot, and uh, we care about your future. We want your we want your lives to turn out, and we want things to go good for you. We want you to get a good education. We also want things to be safe for you, and that you make it through these years successfully. You go out into the world and make a difference. Amen. We hope you'll become uh, followers of Jesus. If you are, most of you are already, which we're glad. But we want you to step up and do something for Him one day. We're going to let Brother Steve Carlson, who is our CEF director, to the late same Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you so much for these young people that uh, as they go back into school tomorrow, or some actually started last week, Lord, we just pray, first and foremost, that they would put you first in their lives, that they would seek your face, that they would desire to know you more fully, and, and that in that process, they would grow in their relationship with you. Lord, we do pray that you would help them uh, to do well in their studies, to, to be able to uh, learn the materials and remember it and be able to do well on the tests, but even more importantly, in the tests, Lord, we pray that you would help them to, to use that to grow and to be used by you in powerful ways. And we thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, kids. Y'all can go ahead and Give them a hand. Brother Mark Thomas, would you go sit next door make sure they know we're on the way? And if you would, when you get them over there, Brother Mark, if you'll say the, the uh, meal prayer for me, but you and Miss Charity go to the front of the line and uh, make sure. We're ready over there? Okay, Michael said we're ready. So if you'll say the prayer when we get over there, and uh, we'll, we'll be ready to go. Y'all ready to go home? Pardon?
We could do that. Once you say the prayer now for the meal, then we will we go ahead and eat and get there.